And I love to matriculate in the book of John because John's writings are so pure, particularly when it comes to the issue of love. You have to understand that John, in coming into a relationship with Jesus, didn't have any toxins, really. And the reason he had no toxins was he was so young when he came to see Jesus that there wasn't any time intellectually for him to be convoluted with any other concept or thought. He was 16, 17 years old when he came in. And so Jesus was simply his only idol, his only icon. It's important to me because unlike Peter, Peter I see in different light. Because Peter was braggadocious and he had his own psychological debilitation to overcome when he was dealing with Jesus. And of course, Judas never could get it straight. But John comes with a sort of freshness. If you look at Matthew, Mark, Luke, you will see synoptic gospels. They see in a particular same vein. But when you read John, you will see Aristotleism. You will see syllogistic reasoning. And you will see a purity of presentation that uh, has to just draw you in. It is said in the book of John that John never mentions his name one time. And he calls himself the other disciple or the disciple who Jesus loved. But he never mentions his own name because he doesn't want to be visible and have Jesus invisible. Jesus becomes a center. He opens each one of the chapters and he presents a very particular encounter with Jesus. From opening in chapter 1, the symphony of a great orchestra, uh, yes, indeed, when he says the word was with God, the word was God, the same was in the beginning with God, uh, that, all of that marvelous. And then he moves from there, and if you go through each one of the chapters, you will find one particular encounter, whether with the man by the pool or the woman with the issue of blood. By the time he gets close to the end, John says, these things are written that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ and believing you might have life through his name. And then in the next chapter, as he closes, he said, and this and many other things did Jesus, that I'm sure if they were all written, the world could not contain the books. In other words, he's simply saying to us, I've told you some specific things that about Jesus, that if you believe, you can have life through his name. And if I were to preach from that text, it would be you've already heard enough to save you. In chapter 10, we pick up with another one of those very specialty things that John does with Jesus. And here he makes an anal analogy, rather, to the shepherd and the sheep. And he makes himself the good shepherd, and he talks about his sheep. By verse 25, 24 really, as he's now getting into the discourse in a very mighty and powerful way. Uh, oh Lord, I, I could go from 19. It says, there was a division therefore again among the Jews for these sayings. And many of them said, he hath a devil and is mad. Why hear him? Others said, there are not the words of him that hath a devil. Can a devil open the eyes of the blind? And it was at Jerusalem, the feast of dedication, and it was winter. Jesus walked into the temple, Solomon's porch. Then came the Jews round about him and said unto him, How long dost thou make us to doubt? If thou be the Christ, tell us plainly. Jesus answered them, I told you, and you believe not. The works that I do in my Father's name, they bear witness of me, but ye believe not, because ye are not of my sheep. As I said unto you, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give unto them eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father, which gave them me, is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. I and my Father are one. Then the Jews took up the stones again, to stone him. 
Look at somebody with all the ebullience you can muster and tell them, no man. Look at somebody else and say, I've been through enough. And I found out no man can pluck me out of his hand. No man. I have been reasoning in recent months and recent weeks and somehow uh, there are some openings in preaching and I'll try to show that when I get to Orlando in May. There are some openings that are, that are very generic. Generic, particularly because if you are opening from the wider point of view and narrowing into what you're doing and what you're seeing. In other words, you take the widest of the context and come into the text. It becomes very generic in the opening because you're dealing with the philosophical concept that em embodies the whole scripture. Not psychological concept, we'll get to that, but the philosophical concept that embodies the whole scripture. And it is true that God has left himself outside of our sensual perception. And that is that nobody in here can have a relationship with God through their senses. You have not seen him at any time. You have not heard him audibly. I hear people saying the Lord speaks to me, but he has never said, no, I need to have a talk with you. Indeed, and in fact, if you check the scriptures carefully, you will find that even when he talked to Elijah, he spoke to him through a still, small voice. And I wonder if a still, anything has any sound at all. The Holy Spirit maketh intercession for us with groanings that cannot be uttered. Which means it's not a mm, because I just uttered that. Yeah. It's a sound that is so silent or non-existent that intellectually and cognitively you cannot grasp what's happening. Because he left himself outside of our sensual perception. Haven't smelled him, haven't touched him at any time. And it's interesting that God would not even allow the Old Testament characters to have an image of him. Because the only image you could have of him would be born out of sensual perception. And how would you describe an omnipresent God? What form would you give him and what would you draw him? You would have to reduce him as they did to four-footed beasts to birds and to the things that they saw around them and you would have completely distorted the greatness of an immutable omniscient eternal God and so he leaves himself outside of our sensual perception which means that he cannot be cognitively brought into being and ah let me put it another way I'm, I'm, I'm gonna get there tonight uh, he is everywhere, but he's nowhere if you don't meet him somewhere. Uh, as if he refuses to reveal himself. You cannot cognitively bring him into your space. Ah, I, my relationship then with God has to be born strictly and from the point of view of revelation. Yeah. As Paul Tillich puts it, revelation must be given, it must be received, or it's not revelation. If God puts it out there and you don't get it, then it's not revelation. So he has to put it out there for you to get it, uh, so that it becomes revelation. Uh, can I take it further? For those who are holding out. To show you that it's not intellectual, that it's not cognitive, there were two boys in their separate mother's wombs. 
Uh, one's name was John and the other was Jesus. Jesus was abiding in the compartment of Mary's womb and John was in his mother's Elizabeth. The both boys were separated by two thin layers of cutaneous tissue and they were unconscious. Yes, there was a sense of awareness in every child even though in the mother's womb but there's a cognitive unconsciousness as it relates to being able to deduce or to logically analyze anything because in the mother's womb there is no capacity. Jesus is God but he was not reading the Jerusalem Tribune in his mother's womb. Uh, who would deliver it please? Uh, there, there's no paper boy that could deliver that and so consequently the boys are unconscious. There is no cognitive cerebral energy jumping off to deduce anything and yet still the Bible says when the boys came close together that John left in his mother's womb and received the Holy Spirit and didn't say Jesus, 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 Jesus. Uh, I hope you're with me. Don't let me lose you now. Now notice if you will the unconscious John had revelation of Jesus and it was not intellectual or cognitive. It is that God just opened up his spirit to the revelation of who he has been sent to point the way. Now the unconscious John knew who Jesus is, yet the conscious John sent messengers to Jesus and said, are you the one? or should we look for another? The conscious John didn't know who he was or struggled with who he was when the unconscious John had received the revelation without question. I just came to tell you don't ever let your mind talk you out of your revelation. Uh, you don't need a committee to vote on what God told you to do. You don't need every body to vote. So the concept of God then is seen outside of sensual perception. And if it's outside of sensual perception, then you're not going to be able to rationalize who he is by looking at him. And that's why each one of us has a different and a very idiosyncratic signature of who God is. We can teach you from the same pulpit and give you all the same structural stuff about God but at the end of the day your conceptualization of God will never be like mine indeed and in fact it can't be duplicated or imitated because it's uniquely yours uh, let me just add something else and go another way and that is pain is individuate there is nobody who feels the pain you feel I don't care how you articulate it. I don't care whether their father died the same day your father died. The pain level in each one of you is different because circumstances, psychological development, intellectual capacity, relationship, and all of that is different in each person. And that's the same way is your concept of God. And what he allows is the freedom to think of him any way you choose because he does not want you to be restricted by somebody else's declaration of who he is. You cannot have a personal relationship with a second-hand God. You can only have a personal relationship when you know him within the context of who you are. Uh, can I take it further? <laughs> no one of us ever has the full knowledge of who God is. That's why we fellowship because I need to know the idiosyncratic concept that you have in order to put pieces together about God that I will never have in my own experience. Oh God and I can't be so locked into who I think I am that when fresh revelation comes I refuse to receive it because it doesn't fit 
the tradition and it doesn't fit my identity. Oh, I feel the spirit of God. Enter now those who were seeking to decide who Jesus is without revelation. You can't know who he is if you don't have it revealed because he could do all the mighty works right in front of your eyes and you never ever receive him for who he is because you're already fixed in your own idiosyncratic traditional sense. Oh, you got to let go who you think you are in order to know who he is and enter the haters. Oh, I feel like preaching now. Uh, can I can I can I back up a little bit? Uh, I'll tell you when I'm there. You see, we have to understand then the divine revelation and the knowledge of God, and we have to understand it in the horizon of promise. You see, this is where they missed it in the Old Testament, the Jews, because they didn't understand that the book they were reading was not a book designed to stand on its own. It was rather just a typology to point to the most significant creature who would ever walk the face of the earth. But they got caught up in who they thought they were. And they became the center of their religious experience. And so now they begin to control, you see, and become very religious. And let me put this in another way. I'm again, epiphany. You see, you can be very religious and not be spiritual uh -huh, uh -huh. and you can follow the ritual the ceremony the symbol and never be spiritual because spirituality carries with it a flexibility that is not locked into tradition but is always looking for fresh and new revelation and so to understand God because again now you don't see God and no man sees God so he doesn't come to us in our sensual perception but he makes us promises and what God does is he makes us promises and then he fulfills the promise he makes because he made us a promise and put the promise in our spirit and then he fulfilled the promise that he put in our spirit then we know it was God. He brings into material something that you believed in your heart, but he did not show up to show you what he was going to do. He just put it in your spirit. Let me put it another way. Your faith has to believe what God has put in your spirit. And what Satan does when something's placed in your spirit is he makes the circumstance as contradictory and as antithetical to the promise that God put in your spirit so that he can get you to abort the promise by not believing that God spoke to you. Uh, I wish somebody would help me here. See, God's got to speak to you, but you don't see him. You only hear him because faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. Then his spirit speaks to your spirit over a bridge of faith and then lets your spirit speak to your mind. If that were not so, you could never have peace which passeth all understanding because it's not a peace that's coming to your mind it's a peace that's coming to your spirit it's by faith that it links your spirit and your spirit can hold on to stuff that your mind can't comprehend how can you believe such a thing and that's how God reveals himself as God and that is he brings it through a promise can can I take that a little further this becomes critical now because he has to be faithful to his word and if he's not faithful to his word I can't be faithful to him because if he's going to vacillate and take me through
through certain psychological vicissitudinous changes, then I'm going to have problems believing him. You have to establish, you have to establish a consistency in keeping your word in order for me to trust you the next time. How many times have you become so controlling because you can't trust? Uh-huh, uh-huh, uh-huh. I don't want to mess with that. But many people who can't trust are people who control. Well, it's 15 minutes to the storm. It's five minutes to pick up the article. And they should be back here in 40 minutes flat. Now, I'll give them two minutes, but 42. I want to know where you are. Uh-huh. Now, I'm not going to mess with that too much. Uh, that's why you got to have passwords and passcodes and checking phone bills uh -huh, when they come in the mail and going through and, and I don't know this number and now you're calling numbers you don't know and uh, who is this on the other side of this number you're doing all of that because you can't trust and the reason you don't trust is you've been hurt and you've got to learn how to heal so you can trust again uh, I feel something helping me here it's a critical piece here because Jesus Christ the same yesterday he's today and forever but here is what we says and we points out and I quote he says the historical background of this book indicates the unchangeableness of Jesus Christ cannot be be the subject of faith of its recipients unchangeable alone is not enough to generate faith unquote but here's what it is it is significant in establishing the consistency of the attributes that establish faith because you've been consistent it helps me to attribute contribute rather to the stand of my faith because I can depend on you I can depend on your word now you can depend on me to believe you I feel it here you've got to do that to help me through it because the presupposition for the knowledge of God is God revealing himself oh you're gonna stand out there and look at his works and never ever acquiesce who he is because you don't have the revelation the minute you get the revelation now you become one of his and if you can't get a revelation you don't belong to the group because the only way to belong to the group is to get a revelation of who he is and if you have no revelation you have no relationship oh I'm here to tell you now preacher can't give you this uh -huh, the deacons can't give you this you got to get this for yourself. <sighs> I feel something pushing me here. I'm, I'm trying to behave. It's critical and very important because it sets you in this place where you don't need a clique or you don't need a committee. You don't need church politics. You ain't got to climb up nobody's ladder. It's just God giving you the knowledge that I am who I am for you. So where God now in his faithfulness to his promise he has given, he stands to that which he has declared and whatever he has promised now he's got to manifest it and that manifestation now brings you to know that was God I'm going to tell you something else before I move on and that is God makes promises in circumstances that are most contradictory to the fulfillment of of the promise and then sometimes he makes a promise and let things go from difficulty to impossibility before he brings it to pass oh God while you're sitting there and the last thing you ever want to ask God is how I don't know if you're with me my children asked me for all kinds of things when they were growing up and the fact that they asked me indicated to me that they had some respect 
for my capacity and my ability. Anytime a child can walk up to dad and say, dad, I need a car and I need none less than a Camaro. And I say, well, all right, well, let's, let's, let's think about it. I'll think about it. But the fact that they could ask puts me in a class beyond themselves because they expect me to be able to do it. Now, the things my children never ever did was ask how because how plays with the faith that you have in God because your mind is going to talk you out of the promise. Now, it goes like this. Now, how is he going to do it? It ain't your business how. It's just your business to believe. Oh, I feel it here because the very reason for creation, I'm almost there, is for the God to reveal himself. The reason for creation, there was no reason for creation except that God would show himself. God has only one image and that's Jesus Christ. And for three years, mankind through recorded history has had had God with them. You and I weren't there. So we have to take the words of the apostles. But the Jews were right there and still couldn't see him. Let me tell you something about folk. When they hate you, you can't do anything good. And that's what haters do. No matter what you do, no matter what level you preach on, no matter how melodious your voice is, it's always going to be, it's all right, but uh, but they ain't living right, but, but they don't talk right, but, but they got an attitude haters, but I got news for you, if you don't have any haters, you're not that gifted. <laughs> Uh, give somebody a high five for the first time uh, and say thank God for your haters uh, your haters get you blessed uh, oh God he created him then uh, and the creation then was to reveal himself uh, to the people he created uh, because God was in the canyons of eternity all by himself uh, because he's eternal uh, and there's no other eternal being so there was nobody with him he created the cherubims and the seraphims and he's the only one I know who will create a creature that is so beautiful that the creature will look at himself and want to be like his creator that's Lucifer if you will I don't think I'd make anybody that good looking that they'd want to be like me the devil is a liar but God is God and you ought to thank him he's God God gives gifts that oftentimes challenges the beneficiary against the giver. Sometimes he gives you a gift and you walk away with the gift and forget the giver. He's the only one who blesses so well that he can become challenged by the very gift that he gives. I feel it. That's why every now and then he moves stuff from us just to see whether or not we love the giver more than the gift. Uh, I'm going there tonight. And so now what the Bible says to us is that this is a praise of his glory. I created so I could reveal myself so that they would be a praise to my glory. In Ephesians, Vincent calls it, we were made a heritage. Uh, King James says we have obtained an inheritance. And what it means is that every sheep has been determined, chosen, and assigned by lot. You didn't meet him when you came to church. You couldn't come up to this pulpit until he drew you because no man comes except the Father draw. So you have to understand now that you are designated as a heritage. You are designated not by chance. It's been determined. You have been chosen and you have been assigned. I want to mess with your theology for a minute. I heard somebody saying, uh, the devil should have killed me when he 
had me. And oh, we get happy. And sometimes as preachers, we pick up what other preachers say and we run with it without giving it any critical analysis. We just take it because somebody shouted in Dallas over it. Well, they are shouting LA. And that's it. We're gone. But if I'm chosen in him and if I've been assigned as a heritage and if I were chosen in him before the foundation of the world, then when did the devil ever have me? It looked like he had me. I acted like he had me. We lived like he had me. But I always belonged to God. Oh, I feel something happening now. Where that key? Find me somewhere. I'll let you know. Uh, Y'all rest a little bit. I got to work. Uh, it is not chance. It is a, uh, there is a purpose. You're not here by chance. You got to get this chip out of your mind and understand who you are. You have allowed too many people to raise you with psychological debilitative vocabularies. Call you stupid and silly and ignorant. God made a creature that had the capacity for revelation of who he is, which means he respects what he has created. And when he came in the cool of the evening, he came to reveal himself to the creature that he blew into his body, the breath of life. And yet still you were living beneath your privilege and you were living under your purpose because your hand Handlers on the human side have given you the disposition that you can't be much of anything. Oh God, I feel it. And that's why it's taken us so long to get to where we needed to go. Because some of us spend the second half of our lives trying to get over the first half. But Jesus says when you meet me and I give you a revelation of who I am, it ought to change everything about your attitude. Oh, I just had an attitude lift. I just had an attitude change. And if you think you can hold me like I'm a nobody, the devil is a liar. No man shall pluck me out of his hand. Uh, I feel a preach coming on. I feel something getting ready to happen. The Bible says, expositors, not only was it the purpose of God to make known the secret of his grace to us, but this purpose was also fulfilled in us in the point of fact, and we were made his own. Not only chosen for his portion, but we were made it. In other words, you were made. God's heritage, you were made it. When he formed you, he formed you for that purpose. The purpose is not for our own privilege. That's the Jews thought that with their limited exclusive view but for his glory. That's why I'm here. That's why you exist. For his glory. That's why he formed you. For his glory. That's why he brings you out of the worst stuff that human beings can ever be in in order to show I can come into the world. Can, can I preach like I feel it? You see, what you do is, if you're in relationship with somebody, you better choose somebody who's close to you. You better choose somebody you can live with because you can't live with everybody. I don't care how sanctified you are. And in case you holding out on me, as fine as you are and as good looking as you are, Somebody left you. <laughs> Mm -hmm. because you can't live with everybody you have to choose somebody who you can't change structurally because I'm not going to have a relationship with anybody who's going to try to take away my roof bearing beams because some people will try to take away the core of who you are and get you to a place where you don't like who you are trying to be with them 
Uh, 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 there are some things that we can change. Those things are not deal breakers. Those things are on the fringe. Uh, I'll come home nine instead of ten. Uh, you know, I'm used to coming home whenever I get ready. But I know that now that you're here, that if I'm going to stay a little late, I need to call. It's going to take me a year to get it down, baby, but I'll have it together after a while. You see, there are some things that don't break any deals, but there are some things that are core to who you are. It's core to me to have a clean house, and I can't live with nobody nasty. Uh, I, I, I just can't do it. I, I just can't do it. Uh, hang up your dress in, in the refrigerator. I can't do it. Uh, and put stuff over chairs and stuff. Put them in the closet. Uh, that's where they belong. I, I'm sorry. That's just the way it is. But God does not have to choose whoever is close to who he is because he has the power to transform. So he chooses according to Paul in Corinthians. He chooses weak things to confound the wise. Oh Lord have mercy. He uses base things to confound the mighty. He chooses despised things. He chooses Lord nothings. He goes all the way down to nothings from foolish to base to weak to despise to nothings. In other words, God can choose the lowest to get the glory out of how he changes them. So that when you look at what you used to be and look at who you are now, you can throw up holy hands and say to God, be the glory. I appreciate what you've done for me. And so now the laying down anything in the view. When you come to purpose, it's the laying down anything in the view of others. And he declares the good shepherd giveth his life for his sheep. And that's because they're mine. I'll die for them and I'll die and cement the whole deal. You see, his purpose has always been to guide you to the place he wants you to be. And every time Satan snips at you because God uses people to bless you and the devil uses them to curse you. And everybody thinks because you move to another level that they can come get you whenever they feel. Have you ever been with a man, baby, that long after it's over, he still believes. Since he's been there before, he can get there again. Uh -huh, uh -huh. I've been around some women, yes I have, who still believe that after all these years, another eyelash up and one down can get me again. Oh yeah, he can't forget this baby. I don't care where he's preaching. All I got to do is show up, honey, because I got it like that. The devil is a liar. I've grown since you met me last. I'm a little bigger since you met me last. I'm a little more discerning than when you met me last. I might as well have church. So what he does with his purpose is he, he does it with his omniscience because he knows it with his omniscience and then he executes it with his omnipotence because you can know something but can't execute it and then he supervises it with his omnipresence which means there's never a time where you're out of his view and then he cannot change it because of his immutability which means he promised me the gift said he'd never let me out of his hand and yet still when I walk away I think like I've lost my blessing the devil is a liar because he can't change it in his mutability so what he does is he spanks me back in line with his purpose give somebody a high five and say neighbor what you're going through is God spanking you back he ain't trying to kill you he's just trying to whoop you back to the place where you belong so he can take you where he wants you to be I feel a little churchy now the lecture is over and then of course he can't stop it because of his eternalness because I am for the praise of his glory now how is he going 
anything to protect it. The best insurance of his integrity is to give it to the heir of all things, the one who made the world. So the Logos doesn't only have the assignment to create, to reveal God. He has the assignment to make sure nothing ever happens to what God has created for his revelation. Give some money high five for the third time and say, neighbor, you're going to make it through it because you're destined to make it through it because not only through him, but in him, all things exist. Any challenge against God is a challenge against me and any challenge against me is a challenge against God and he's already searched out every one of your enemies and he's come back with the declaration that no man shall pluck them out of my hand no man can stop you from being everything that God has called you to be I'm getting ready to close but I feel something pushing me I feel something lifting me what God sent me here to tell you is you got to have a new attitude a new psychology towards the stuff you go through and don't back up and act like folk can control your destiny because when they nailed him on the cross they nailed him between the radius and the carpal bone and it cut the median nerve and when the median nerve got cut his hands went into a claw but I'm so glad that my hand was in his hand when it became a claw so he's holding me in a death grip in a death grip do you know how many times Satan tried to open God's hand to get to me but he couldn't move it that's why the Lord told me no weapon formed against you shall well, it ain't gonna work. Get somebody high five. Say it ain't gonna work. It ain't gonna work. I got too much favor. I got too much favor. No man can take my joy. No man can take my anointing. No man can take my vision. No man can take my destiny. No man can take my blessing. No can take my, my anointing. Get some money high five. Said I looked everywhere, but I ain't found nobody. Cause I heard him say that my father is greater than all. And no man can take him out of my father's hand. And I and my father are one. If you can't get it from him, you can't get it from me. Give somebody a high five. Say, I've been to hell and back, but I'm still here, still praising him, still lifting him up. Look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, I don't look like what I've been through. Cause I No man, no man. I feel like preaching in here. Touch somebody for the sixth time and say, neighbor, they tried to stop my gift. They tried to stop my blessing. They tried to take my job. They tried to take my house. But no man, no man. If God let you have it, it ain't the man. It's God getting ready to take me. <laughs> this is your season. This is your hour. And no man can stop you. Shake 
shake somebody's hand for the last time and say, I want you to know that no man can stop you from your next level. Get up there. 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 Get up taught all of us are taught what the scripture says we always dwell and particularly those of us who matriculated somebody's seminary we know for the most part how to expostulate what it says but every now and we, are, we are, have to ask this question to take it from the philosophical to the psychological. Why is he telling me this? Why? Of all the things that he could have written, why is he telling me this? What psychological debilitation is he trying to correct how should I think after I heard it from before I heard it? Because he's writing it there to increase my faith. And to give me an assurance that no matter how rough things are, and no matter how spiritually suicidal I am, The hope of the glory, and I'm closing. I'm going to close three times. This is the first close. When I deal with the hope of his glory, the, the hope of his glory, I, I'm not talking about having automobiles. I already have some of the best in the world. I, I'm not talking about cars. And if you take all of them away from me, fine. The thing that is, that where is me the most is me. The thing that I pray about the most is being a better person and not making young men mistakes as an old man. The thing I pray most about is wanting to be more in his image because I got all the things and still not feel good about myself I wonder do you see what you see, see it's about what, it, what I want him to do with me so, so I'm nervous anxious about him fulfilling what he started to do with me. And sometimes that might mean taking my car, taking my house. That might mean a whole lot of stuff. And, 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 and for you capitalistic folk who want to run up here real fast and tell me, uh, uh, Job got double for his trouble. There are some things that God took from Job that were irreplaceable. So how many kids did Job have? Ten. And at the end, how many did he have? Ten. But they weren't the same ten. Which one of your children would you give up to have another one later? 
them first 10 children were irreplaceable. Because the next 10 weren't the same 10. In fact, I'd have said to the Lord, I'd prefer if you raise them 10 from the dead. Because I, I know these 10, these, these other new set of 10. Understand this. He wants you to think with greater assurance that no matter where you are, there is therefore now no condemnation because the enemy will destroy you if he can get you into self-condemnatory psychological avenues because it's one thing for it to be on the outside there's another thing for it to come inside I'm closing for the second time if you ever learn any truth learn the truth of having to forgive yourself. And the easiest way to be able to forgive others is to take responsibility for your own life. It goes like this. If you did it to me, I allowed it. I, I, I ain't five years old now. Amen. If you did it to me, I allowed it. And only two things can go on. is either I allow it or I'm the perpetrator. So I've learned now, it's on me. It's on me. So I forgive myself for what I allow. And I sure enough forgive myself for what I did. Because you cannot say that God forgave you if you can't process it into self-forgiveness. Here's what I want you to know. To the preacher that's in here who messed up, cut up, and did something awful that everybody talked about. When God gave you the gift before the foundation of the world. He knew what you were going to do when he gave it to you. And he gave it to you anyway. Because the gifts and callings of God are without repentance. He don't have to repent. Why should he change his mind when he had all the information up front? So now you get up. Get up. You have something to offer the world. Don't allow what God already knew you were going to do. So what the Lord is saying to you like he's saying to Peter, when thou art converted, strengthen the brethren. We need you back in this race. I'm closing for the third time. Somebody looked at the clock and said, third time. Take somebody's hand. Take one person by both hands. You are somebody. You are somebody. God made you somebody. His heritage. Good God Almighty. Dear Father, we come in the name of Jesus. And we thank you because you've given us a wonderful privilege when you told us whatsoever things we bind on earth abound in heaven. Thank you for the privilege. Thank you for the authority. And as I squeeze one hand, I bind depression. I bind low self-esteem. I bind every spirit that says I deserve this. I bind that spirit right now. You did not create me to be abused. 
you created me for the praise of your glory so I bind every spirit that feels like it's got to take mediocrity and live with all kinds of debilitative actions and behavior I come against that spirit right now that's not agape that's foolishness and I bind it now I bind whispering I bind that mindset that accepts the negative over the positive I bind that mindset that deals with negative criticism and will not accept praise oh God I come now against every suicidal spirit whether it be physical or spiritual, I come against it now. I bind it in the name of Jesus. Now, now, I thank you, Lord, for the privilege of loosing things. You said whatever we loose on earth is loose in heaven. Somebody squeeze the other hand. I loose your joy. I loose your finance. I loose your vision. I loose your revelation. I loose your energy right now. Step up to the next level. Step up to where God would have you. And I claim it in the name of Jesus. Go there. Go there. Go there. Somebody holler, I'm going there. Loose those hands and put your praise on it. Put your praise on it. If you believe God, put your praise on it. If you're going to the next level, put your praise on it. Ah. Woo. Woo. Oh, it's all right to praise it. Praise him till you get it out. Until you live, 